You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get started with this week's episode, which is another story from Cobb Keating and the movie The Outpost, so stay tuned. You guys will love this one. Wanted to take a quick second to give you guys some feedback. We love hearing from you guys, and when we get great notes from people, we like to share them. This one is from Alex, and he wrote us an email, and he said, I felt compelled to write and convey how mesmerized I am by your podcast. The production is amazing, and the interviews are riveting. Although I myself never had the privilege of serving in the military, I've spent a lot of time with veterans. I pass your podcast along to everyone I can. I imagine I am not the only person that has regrets about not joining the military. That being said, I strive to do well for my community and contribute in any way I can. So in short, thank you both for showing me a window into the incredible lives of the bravest and best this country has to offer. I also wanted to offer myself as a contact. I'm a commercial offshore lobster captain up in Maine. I started out as a deckhand for my great uncle, a Navy man stationed in Italy in the 50s. I think working on fishing boats might lend itself well to someone coming out of the military. Working on lobster boats is all about hard work, suited for someone able to pick things up quickly, people that gravitate towards high-intensity work. Again, thank you so very much for what you guys do, and keep it up. And thank you very much, Alex. And if you're up in the main area, reach out to us and we'll certainly connect you with Alex. On that note, we appreciate the Apple Podcast reviews. Keep it going. We're shy of 400. We got a ways to go to get to 1,000. But remember, if you like the show overall, give it five stars. Even if you have feedback, good or bad, the rating is about the show overall, not just one aspect of it. Speaking of reviews, we have heard from you guys that you're having difficulty hearing some of the guests in the episodes, especially when they're calling in. We're working on that. We're always trying to continue to improve the quality of the show, and that includes production. So if you have any other feedback on it, please let us know. We certainly want to hear them. Lastly, our big news is coming up very soon, I promise. I know we've left you hanging on, but I promise it is coming very, very soon, and we are very, very excited. Don't forget to follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and don't forget about our promotion with Amazon on our website, hazardground.com. I know that was a lot. You guys are dying to hear this week's episode, so here it is. Joining us this week on the Hazard Ground is a retired Army captain who went to West Point and after five years in the military, left the active service and went on to become a filmmaker and director. One of his most notable films is called The Outpost, which is based on a book written by CNN chief correspondent Jake Tapper, and it's the story of the Battle of Kandesh, which we have told several times on this show. But the inspiration for making that film came through his own personal loss and tragedy. He is Rod Lurie joining us on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Rod, welcome, brother, and thanks for being here. You know, th- thank you for letting me be here. You know, when you hear the term retired as a captain, you know, I, I don't really buy the word retired as a captain. He's sort of like, you know, he petered out as a, as a captain. He's more, <laughs> he more maxed like out at 03, like. yeah. Well, it's like, you know, look, if I, you know, I, uh, I graduated in 1984 from West Point. So what that means is I did not go into the, uh, I went into the peacetime army. So, you know, I did my, I did my time. I went, you know, did some peacetime tours and, and then I, and then I got out. But, you know, when people go to Afghanistan or they go to Iraq and they, you know, they get shot at and they're, and they're shooting at people and they're, you know, getting blown up, then then you can retire after five <laughs> years. You know, I just sort of said fuck it after five years and and uh, and got out. So well, if, if I think that's, that's being a little bit more honest. Then why West Point? You know, I you know I'm I was I'm an immigrant to this country, and uh, one of the many reasons that I went to West Point is that it definitely was a a way to pay back. And um, you know, I was 17 years old. I went and I visited the uh, the academy, and uh, most young men, when they at that time now young women, when they, when they go in there and they spend time there, it's like incredibly romantic and and very um, very beautiful and very grand, and you get a sense of a, of accomplishment there, and the history that they teach there, um, um, the, the men, the history that they teach was made by the men that they taught. And you really get a you really get a sense of it of its grandeur, and you know my parents didn't have to pay for me to go there. I mean everything about it, you know, sort of sort of made sense. But but there's something else, which is that you know you're 17, you don't know that you made the right decision. It's not like we're these mature entities, and um, you know 
I, I was a pretty terrible cadet. <laughs> I was a I, I was a, a relatively good officer, but you know I was destined for other things. And and in point of fact, I always knew I wanted to be a filmmaker, even when I went to to West Point. Every t- everywhere I went, I would ask myself, okay, where where would you put the camera? What's the best place for the camera here? You know, what story can I tell at West Point, which is something I eventually want to do. So, you know, you, you go to, I, you know, I don't, as a filmmaker, I can tell you, I don't believe in film school. I believe you should go and study what you want to make movies about. And um, I always knew that movies the most interested me were movies about character, movies about leadership, movies about principle, and well, on earth in West Point for that. So, in your time at West Point, I mean, what's the one thing you took away from it? Like, what, what's something that stays with you? I mean, it, it's such a rich tradition, obviously, and, and everybody mm-hmm. who went there has their own individual story to tell. But, you know, what about the Academy still stays with you to this day? Well, I, I, I'll tell you, 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 you want to know something? After all these of doing interviews and after maybe the two to 300 interviews I've done in the outposts, that's a question nobody has ever asked me, and it's a good question. And the answer to that question is what you learn is never to panic and that there is a solution for everything. You know, essentially when you're an officer and even and when you're an NCO and even when you're a soldier and when you're a film director, it's problem solving. It's always problem solving and that you understand that every problem has a solution. And uh, the notion of never panicking is something that I was taught very, very well at, at the academy and something that definitely has stuck with me. And I may be jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit, but you know, um, The Outpost, which is a movie about the Battle of Kamdesh, it, it, that, that set was filled with veterans, mm-hmm. filled with people with military experience. It was one of the things that I demanded uh, for my set. And so you had all these magnificent problem solvers on the set. And, you know, people panic all the time on movie sets. We're running out of time, we're running out of light, we're running out of money, we're running out of expertise. This actor is behaving badly, et cetera, et cetera. And yet we were able to, you know, always solve our problems because I had all these military minds around me and a couple of other West Point minds as well. And so, you know, that was very helpful. You talk about problem solving, and then you mentioned you were a below average cadet. Was this something you struggled with at the academy itself? Below average doesn't begin to describe it. <laughs> I was trying to be generous. <laughs> well, look, you know, I, I, you know, let's just say that um, the military discipline and um, and the military um, mindset was not something that I went into the academy with at all. Right. So, you know, I, I wasn't that organized. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have even have the skill set to parade properly. Um, you know, un- understanding weapon systems, understanding, you know, even my M16, uh, was just not part of my skill set. So from a military point of view, I was substandard. I eventually became, I would say, standard. Um, academically, um, I was a little bit below par also. Um, because uh, although I think I would have graduated close to the top of my class in my concentration or major, which is political science and international relations, we, you know, we were also forced, and I underline the word forced, to study things like thermonuclear engineering. And that is like completely fucking foreign to me. It's and completely foreign and, to everybody and, who's not into thermonuclear for, well, engineering. Well, <laughs> there are some studs there, you know, there are some academic, you know, it's a very good school and there are, a lot of MIT and Harvard-bound uh, grad students there. Uh, but I was not one of them. And so, you know, I, I just I made great friends over there, and I, I guess I had some limited leadership skills. But as a military mind and as an academic mind, you know, I, I, I wasn't up to par. I, I was, I'm lucky that I graduated. I'm very honored that I graduated. And, um, and I think I took away the values from West Point that are the most important values to have. But to say I was anything less than, um, anything more than remotely serviceable as a cadet would be a lie. I got to tell you, Rod, you have painted a completely different picture than every other West Point grad that I've ever talked to. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, 
you know, it, it's 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 interesting because there are tons of cliches about West Pointers, and there are tons of cliché about military people uh, themselves. That you know that you know where where people have biases about what they think a military person even is, and um, so you know when you say you know, and a lot of people will say that you know you're not what I expected from a West Point grad, and so you know what does that mean? And and many times it means somebody who's a little narcissistic. It means uh, somebody who's really squared away and uh, you know militarily squared away. And, you know, I think a lot of those things just, you know, they, that they simply aren't true. They're simply not correct. And I am, um, you know, very, very proud of my academy. I love my academy and I love, you know, and I love what it stands for as well. No, perfect. I mean, again, uh, when I say a different experience, you know, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of different people who come out of out of the academy uh, and they go on right. to do a variety of different things. And, and that, I think, is is generally underscored about West Point uh, and all military mm-hmm. academies that, you know, that you're sort of predetermined on a path when you go there. And uh, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's great to see that there are people who took a road less traveled, if you will, coming from the academy. I mean, well, I, I definitely did that because before I was a uh, movie maker, I was the last thing you expect from a West Point graduate uh, because at least directors are, are leaders, right? Mm-hmm. The uh, the last thing you'd expect is uh, you know is uh, you know I was a film critic. Oh wow! And yeah, and uh, you know, and and a pretty you know substantial one in terms of the publications and the radio shows I worked for. So you know that 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 there you really don't expect it. I was an investigative reporter, and you know, a political commentator, and but it's you know all. You know, eventually my dream was to to make movies, and so you know, the, I, I just went uh, to the path that uh, I had always hoped I would take. Before we get to the movie part, I'm just kind of curious. You graduate from West Point. Where do, where do you branch? Where do you go? Where do you spend your your post uh, military? I um your- well, I, I you know I did my basic course at Fort Bliss with the Air Defense Artillery, mm-hmm. and my first my first major posting was. In uh, Gießen, Germany, with the 2-2 artillery, which is, I believe, with an out of front Hawk missile system, and uh, I would say that's where I spent the plurality of my of my career was was there. I eventually went and became the post coordinator of Fort Totten in New York, and when uh, a family member of mine got quite ill, oh, and I had gosh. to be close to them. But and one and another reason why another reason why I left the service, although the primary reason was to really start down this process of, you know, of my dream of eventually becoming a filmmaker. You had mentioned some of the things that you had done prior to becoming a director. So what is that path like? And, and you know, chronologically, well, where does it go from after well, you leave the military? I, well, I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you, actually, when I was uh, derosing, um, I was I was on a plane, um, American Airlines, and I literally took out a piece of paper and I said, what's my path? And I said, I'm going to follow the traditional path to becoming a filmmaker, which is I'm going to become a film critic first, get to really know that world, and then I'm off to becoming a filmmaker. And now how do I become a film critic? And what I said I was going to do is I was going to go to my hometown of Greenwich, Connecticut, go to the smallest newspaper there, and offer them to work, you know, for like almost for free, maybe like $25 a pop. And, um, and that's... And then I'll become a, a you know a filmmaker eventually, and so I went to the Greenwich News. I became their film critic, critic. and um, little did I know that in the history of the United States, nobody who was a regular film critic became a film director. Not one person. There were a couple of film essayists like Paul Schrader, uh, who did, or Bogdanovich, but um, no one who reviewed films on a regular basis ever became a film critic. And uh, I would later, later learn why. We can talk about that when we get to it. But um, I became the film critic for the Greenwich News. And then um, I took some of that and became a film reporter for the New York Daily News, interviewing movie stars. And uh, I got married. I moved to uh, California, where I went to Los Angeles Magazine, um, volunteered to do a couple of movie pieces for them. And eventually became their film critic. And from there I became the critic of uh, KABC Radio. 
Now, all that time, I was writing screenplays, hoping, uh, ho- ho- you know, hoping that that they would translate in some sort of assignment. And eventually, um, that did happen. I hooked up with a producer who loved one of my screenplays, and um, it was a movie called Pork Chop. And um, it was about um, a day in the life of a history, the last day in the life of a pimp in New York City. And I, um, I, Ray Fiennes, the actor, was going to play the lead role or he was interested in it. And I was supposed to take a trip to go meet with him at CAA. Mm-hmm. And I'm driving there and I get a phone call from my producing partner who said he just heard from CAA. And when they, when they found out that I was coming, they said that if I tried to enter the building, they would have security escort me out <laughs> because of a review, because of a review I had written really? about, about Danny DeVito. I said some really nasty stuff and, um, I don't want to repeat it here because it, w- it was in fact inappropriate. I should never have said it and, or never have written it. And, um, and uh, so, you know, it was just an example of why, why it is difficult to become a filmmaker and being a film critic. But I, I, made a sh- I, I made a short film without any stars, and that short film um, won almost every film festival that it entered. And as a result, I was able then to translate that into convincing actors to make a very small film of mine called Deterrence. And when I made that small film that convinced some bigger actors to do a movie called The Contender. Mm-hmm. And that movie, that movie, The Contender, uh, was bought by Steven Spielberg. And, you know, we went to the Academy Awards and it became, you know, really my launching pad. And then I had a career after that. So that's the, that's the nuts and bolts of it. It's boring, but, uh, but that, that's what it is. You know, there are a lot of people who enter Hollywood from the outside in uh, and when they they get the peripheral view that you got as a as a critic and, and somebody hosting a radio show, you sort of see the inside ugly without having to live the inside ugly. Did you were you aware of that? Like, did that ever? Does anything about that ever turn you off and saying, you know, Hollywood isn't what I thought it was going to be? Do I really want to enter this field? I sort of knew how. You know, I, I you know when I sort of entered Hollywood. I was a little bit older than uh, than most people as they as they begin, so I was not that naive. And I, you know, and I, and I, there is a lot. There is indeed a lot of ugly. There's a lot of beauty too, though. And um, so, you know, I was um, uh, I was always sort of in, always sort of in love with it. You know, I, you know, I I met a lot of people who were my heroes, and uh, you know, and I love sitting with them and hearing the stories about how some of my favorite movies were made. And, you know, getting, getting the inside scoop on all of that. And you really are living in a world of extremely creative people. Um, you know, I, you know, I've had some very, very rough times. So I've had a lot of really good times too. And, and, um, I mean, that's kind of, I didn't mean that as, as a negative, that's kind of what I was relating to. I mean, I, listen, I work in talk radio, right? I work in sports talk radio and people, you know, there are young people who always ask me, you know, oh, how do I get mm-hmm. into this business? And the first thing I tell them is don't. Like, you know, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it looks glamorous from the outside, right? As the listener or the viewer, you know, it looks glamorous, but it's it's a war of attrition on the inside. And, and there's a lot of downs. And yes, like you said, there are some ups, there are some really good ups. But for the most right. part, you know, it, it's not a career that I would look at people and go, you know, there are a lot of the things you can do with your life that pay you a lot more money that you're really going to be happy doing. Like this is yeah, not for but, the faint but, of... <laughs> well, it's, yes, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. And, and I'll tell you, I would have loved to, have, what do you do in sports radio? You're a broadcaster? Yeah, or, I'm a host. I'm a, I'm a radio show host. Oh, great. Okay. I didn't even know that's, that's fucking fabulous. I mean, I would love to have your job. That's, that's a great job. If all Again, you can do is. I would is, love to have is, your job too, but I, I guarantee you after we switch for a week, we might just want to go back to what we normally do. <laughs> well, you know what? Let's, let's, why don't we do that? Let us in fact switch for a week. I will get on the, you're on the radio or are you doing radio, part? Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. Okay, I'll get on your. I'll do your radio show for a week, and you can come and try to hustle my scripts for a week, because that's really what I do is hustle my work. You know, much more than actually work. Right, it's hustling <laughs> to get to work. To that end, you know, I'm curious about the level of failure that you deal with in, in trying to get your first movies made and everything else, and sort of what did you draw on from West Point, if anything, that kind of kept you going? Because well, it, buddy, th- this is exactly what I'm fucking talking about. You know, it's like, you know, you, you have problems and, and perseverance. That's all that the academies are. 
it's perseverance. You go into those places at 18 years old, and what they're expecting of 18-year-olds is sort of magnificent. 1,500, 1,500 zero, zero, people came into my class in 1984, and 900 of them graduated. That's a massive attrition rate yeah. when you consider – when you consider how carefully vetted these, you know, these kids are before they come in. So, you know, when you enter, you know, one of the things, another thing that I've taken away from being, having been a West Point graduate is I can always say, well, I've been in a tougher, in a tougher spot than this. Right. And, you know, and so uh, I, I, I will tell you, I write most of my, most of what I direct is uh, I write. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that I have five times as many unproduced screenplays as I have produced screenplays. And, you know, and you put your heart and your soul into this stuff and then nobody wants to do it. And, and heart and soul and time. You know, my, my wife, Kira, she's a novelist, right? And um, up until now, every novel that she's written has gotten published and some of them have been bestsellers, New York Times bestsellers, in fact. But she's working on a book right now She's on page six or seven hundred. She's been working on it for years. She doesn't know that it's going to be published. And that'll, that'll just be like beyond devastating if she doesn't. But in the film world, I'm sort of assuming my stuff is not going to get made. You know, I, you know, un, un, unfortunately. But when it does get made, when it does get made, there's no greater a feeling on 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 earth. There's no greater a feeling. Yeah, I mean. you know. When you when you when I when I wrote the um, when I wrote the contender, and I said, okay, uh, you know, interior, U.S. Senate, and you describe your characters, and then you come on set, and there's the U.S. Senate that we built, and there and there are the characters that you wrote, and it came out of your head, and now it's standing in front of you. It's just man. It's a world for narcissists, I'll tell you. If you, you know, they, 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 those people will do very well in this world because you really have created your own world, and that is just something that's completely magnificent if you can pull it off. Yeah, if you can pull it off. You mentioned easy. you mentioned about all the screenplays you wrote that didn't ever get made. Is there one in particular that you still kick yourself over and go, "Damn, this should have been a movie." Well, yeah, and, and and it will be a movie. I mean, oh, okay. I will continue to I will continue to fight. I'll tell you, there there have been there have been uh, you know quite a few projects like that, and you know one of them is a film about, about West Point. You know, and I, it's it's reviving itself a little bit, and it's always been my dream to make a movie uh, set at the academy. Um, in in uh, in fact, I'll tell you something that I've uh, this probably is the best form, a good form to tell it. I've never told the story before, but uh, you know, many many years ago, um, to almost twenty years ago, I was approached with a, uh, a screenplay called Heart of a Soldier, and it was a love story set at set at West Point, and West Point did not had not approved it to be shot at West Point, and um, I came on. And I rewrote the screenplay, essentially, um, with the very specific hopes that West Point would agree to let me film there. West Point had not allowed anything to be filmed there, no movie since the 40s, and uh, no, no project at all since a TV movie in 1976 called Women at West Point. And so it's the jewel, really, of the military, and they just um, didn't allow anything. So I go, uh, Paul Walker was going to play um, the cadet. Uh, Jessica Alba was going to play the, um, the romantic interest. And I can't believe I'm telling you the story. I'm probably going to get in a lot of trouble. But I, <laughs> it's, a long time, it's a long time ago, so maybe I'll get away with this. But I go with the good folks from Universal. We, we travel down there to West Point. And everybody is a little cynical going down there, especially from – uh, liberal Hollywood, because what they're expecting, I think that what they're expecting are a bunch of conservatives, by the way, completely fucking false. It's just a, a total falsehood. It's just not what the military is. Right. And it's not. It's, you know, it, it, it's it, it's a pretty well-divided organization. But they expect these guys with knives between their teeth and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And they get there and they meet with these kids and these are like great-looking young men and women. They're incredibly intelligent 
They're studying science. They're studying Latin. They're studying American history. They're studying world history. They're studying languages. And they come away and they're incredibly impressed. And then we, we go to meet with the superintendent of West Point, three-star general. And <clears throat> it's me and the producers. And the producers are behaving like Hollywood producers. They're slick. Everything's going to be okay. I believe they called the general baby at some point. Hey, baby, it's going to be great. Don't you worry, you know, and so on. And he stops them and he says, you know, I have to tell you something. He says to the producers, I don't know you. I don't know you. Then he turns to me and he says, I know you. He says, I know you. And um, if you tell me that you're not going to fuck us, then I'll do this. And I said, sir, we're not going to fuck you. And then he said, okay, I'm in. And a few months later, the Iraq war starts. Yeah. And Universal pulls the plug on the movie. And I got a call from um, the, the colonel who was the right-hand man to the, to the general. And um, he says, we've been had by you. He said it to me. And that was one of the most depressing moments of my life and my career. Wow. You know, and that really sucked. And it, it wasn't my fault. I didn't start a fucking war. <laughs> and I didn't make, and I'm not the head of Universal. And, but, you know, but I... What I, you I, know I, is what we all know is that you're in the military, the word, your word is your bond. And, right. And, and you so, looked that man in the yeah. eye and said, I got you. Yeah. And it didn't happen, so he has no choice but to look at you and say, you let me down. And that is disappointing You know, as hell. It, that's, that is correct. And that is why it felt like in the moment I shouldn't equivocate, that I was very confident, that I knew that I would never screw him. Um, I didn't anticipate that. Maybe I should have said, well, unless President Bush starts a war... I got your back, you right. know, <laughs> but I didn't have the mindset to do that. But, you know, we were deep into it. I mean, we were, you know, they were, we were working out a schedule and they were, you know, and they were changing schedules of cadets and you know, what, what, what classrooms we could use and when we could shoot and how we could shoot. And it was, it was a big fucking deal. And then, you know, it all went up in smoke. So I really, really want to do, um, I want to do a boxing epic at West Point. Hmm. That's what I want to do. Well, if you ever need and, somebody to play a colonel for that movie, call me. I think I'd fit the role well. Well, how, how old are you right now? Oh, I can't divulge my age. I'm like a woman. No, I'm 42. You're 42. Okay, you're about a colonel's age. Yes. I remember when I remember when we looked at colonels and they were like creaky and old. No, and I'm, I'm a, I'm and, a very know. young colonel. In fact, I, no, I'm but I, you know what I mean. I mean, the, when I was a cadet, if you were a colonel, yeah, you were it old. was like uh, it wasn't like you were a Zeus, but you were like Apollo. You know, you're old, you know, and yeah. now, now l listen, I, my classmate at West Point is H.R. McMaster, who was the national security advisor to Trump before he bailed on Trump. Yeah. And, you know, Pompeo was a year behind me, uh, two years behind me. And, you know, and so like, it's like, what I find funny is that all these knuckleheads who I knew from the academy are now running the world. And I'm going, the world's in, in a lot of trouble. <laughs> you know, these guys. These I guys knew you trash. way back when, yeah. I, I mean, again, yeah. I, uh, to, your, to your credit, I have run into some West Point cadets that I looked at in my military career and went, how did you get into West Point? Yeah. Like, right. Well, that, that's there? a better question. That's yeah. a better question. That's, right. You know, you know I, I, I'll tell you something else. Sure. To, you know, if there happen to be young young people listening or thinking about going to West Point or Annapolis or those schools. Another reason why I wanted to go there, you know, it, it, there, there was another calculated decision if we're being really honest. And that is that I wanted to go to a school, first of all, to a great school. And West Point is a great academic school. It's one of the best on planet Earth, in my opinion. But I also wanted to go to a school where for the rest of my life, when I said I went to this school, people would say, wait a second, tell me that story. That's interesting, right? Like a lot of people go to, you know, they go to Harvard or go to Yale. And you know what? That, that's, that's nice. But it's, you know, There's a lot a of people there. do. Right. It's not a story. You know, they got there because of family connections or whatever. There are a couple of schools if you go to, they're really interesting stories. West Point in Annapolis is one of them. 
MIT is another because you no know, one gets favored into, into MIT. The, uh, the other place that I considered going as a white guy was Howard University or Morehouse. You would be a white guy going to an all black school. HBCU, That's also, yeah. <laughs> it's a story, right? So, you know, so it's a, it's another reason that I had, uh, that I had considered going there. Amazing stuff. All right, let's transition to uh, the outpost and and the making of this film. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's start leading up to it. You know, uh, when does it first land in front of you on your desk? When do you first hear about the Battle of Kamdesh and and what do you know about it and kind of the genesis of the beginning? Well, I, I had heard about the Battle of Kamdesh and everyone else heard about the Battle of Kamdesh on on the news. Um, I heard about it at the same time that Jake Tapper heard about it and decided to write the book. You know, but Jake Tapper, by the way, a CNN host, um, there is no journalist on planet Earth that is more pro-United States military and veteran than Jake Tapper. It's what he's done for us is simply incredible. Um, and uh, that book that he wrote, The Outpost, is a ma- it's a masterpiece. Uh, studying this outpost that was placed at the, ba- at the bottom of the Hindu Kush Mountains, a completely disastrous Location yes. that eventually we all knew would lead to um, the Taliban descending upon our troops in uh, numbers too big to handle, and that's exactly what they did. Um, l- let me divigate for a second to tell you something which you might find amusing, which was when I was a plebe at West Point, I had a um, there was a squad leader named Mick Nicholson. He was a junior at the time that I was a plebe. He was the most squared away cadet that maybe has ever walked the face of West Point. A fantastic cadet, which is why I think why they assigned him to me to so that he would, you know, chase me out of the academy with his uh, <laughs> absolute, absolute, uh, you know, uh, squared awayness. Uh, he was a great cadet, but he became Colonel Nicholson. He's now four star General Nicholson, but Colonel Nicholson set up the outpost. The outpost that my movie's wow. about. He's the one. He's the one that that created it. So so anyway, um, Jake writes this book, and um, there are a couple of writers that read this book. There was a number of people that tried to adapt it into a film. It was at Universal for a while, and um, then uh, a guy named Paul Tamasi and his partner Eric Johnson get a free option on the book. They had written a movie called The Fighter, for which they had been nominated for the Academy Award. And um, the director, Sam Raimi, um, comes aboard. Do, do you know who Sam Raimi is? Does that name ring a bell with you? Not completely, no. You, well, you've seen his movies because he did The Evil Dead. He did a Spider-Man. Okay. Yeah, there you, you know, go. He's a, he, he is what you call a big-time director. And, um, and Sam um, um, was very interested in making the film until he wasn't for some reason. I think maybe he felt he didn't want to do a true a true story. He didn't want to he didn't want to risk alienating the Gold Star families. You know, he, I, I just think that it may have been um, he he had maybe bitten off more than he wanted to true. Not that he could true, but wanted to true. And so he invites me in for a meeting uh, to discuss whether or not I would consider directing the film, and he would uh, and he would produce it. And. Um, I was interested, but uh, became unavailable. I had to do an uh, actually another a civil a post civil war a military project, uh, a pilot called Monsters of God. And um, but when I was done with that, about a year later, Sam Raimi was off the movie, and his assistant and head of development, a guy named Paul Merriman, um, came to me and said, "Listen, would you like to do this after all?" And I said, sure. They, they actually wanted to do, uh, some of the people don't know, they wanted to make a miniseries out of it, uh, which um, I did not think was a great idea. Why? Because I thought, well, because I thought that um, it would just be repetitive. You know, it, it's, it's, a very, it's a very intense story, but over 10, 10 hours of it is maybe a bit much and a bit repetitive. And, uh, but they told me that there had been this one company that – have been interested in making it called Millennium. And Millennium is this company that makes these uh, mid-budget actioners. And they're, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're good movies. People watch them. They're very successful. Uh, the titles are Rambo, uh, The Expendables, Angel Has Fallen, 
you know, Olympus Has Fallen, movies like that. Um, <clears throat> but the writers were not that, and the producers were not that into it because they thought it just isn't the same kind of, it's not, their kind of film is not the film that we want to make. And I said, well, let's go in there and tell them what we want to make. And if they say, okay, then, you know, what's, what's the harm? What, like, so, year month was this when this was all going on? This was a, this was late uh, 2017, I would say. Okay. And so I, you know, we, we go in there and I, and, I, and I lay out what I think are the ground rules for making the film. And the, I held up the screenplay and I said, first of all, this is going to change. We're going to take out everything in here that's not true. I mean, it's a really good screenplay. But I said, we're going to take in everything that's not true. We're going to make it as true as we possibly can or at least be honest. And then I said, and I want to shoot it. I, I had seen a movie called Dunkirk mm -hmm. about uh, by Christopher Nolan. It was so creative. I said, we also have to find a really creative way of shooting this, something that's not just staying. We're not making an action film. We're making a war film. So what can we do? And I said, in order to make it really immersive, I want to shoot the battle scene in, in long, long takes, right? No cutting away. You stick with the guy. You go through his panic his fear mm -hmm. and his courage with him. Now, this is something that basically studios never want to hear about because if you do long takes, then you can't cut into it. You can't shorten the film. You can't speed it up. You have to count on what you get on the day. And then finally, I, I said, and here is, here is a, a line that uh, cannot be crossed. I said, I want to hire veterans. And specifically, I want to hire as, as much as possible, actors who had been vet who are veterans. By that, I don't mean hire um, people who are not professional. There are plenty of actors who have done service. Right. And that's who I want to hire. And to be honest with you, that might have been the, mo the bitterest pill for them to swallow. And the reason for that is we're going to shoot this film overseas. So they're going to want me to hire a lot of people from London um, who can speak with a great American accents, which is what they often do over there, or Europeans who can speak with American accents so they don't have to pay them SAG rates and they don't have to fly them first class from the United States and um, they don't have to pay them the same per diem. You know, all the rules are different. It's a major, major cost thing. Now, I don't begrudge them that at all, that they are being responsible to their studio. Sure, But if I'm saying, you know, I need to get these guys from the United States and flying them over, you know, that's adding a lot of, a lot, a lot to the budget. It's adding a shitload to the budget. And, um, uh, but they agreed. And so a lot of the actors that you see in the film were prior service. And a couple of them, one of them, Daniel Rodriguez, Mm -hmm. was actually in the Battle of Kamdesh and plays himself. We had him on the show. Yeah. Oh, that's right. He's an amazing guy. Yes. I mean, th 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 this guy this guy is um, a mountain of potential and ambition. And, you know, he saved our asses. All these guys saved our asses, but he, he was uh, – he, so he probably talked to you about how profound it was for him to recreate the death of his best friend. Yeah. Kevin Thompson, mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, we can talk more about that in a minute. But so I, I go to um, you know I go to Millennium and 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 they and they uh, they more or less agree to this. And um, then it was off to casting and off to budgeting. And we went and scouted in Morocco, and then we settled on Bulgaria, which is where their studio is. And uh, so I mean that's the long and the short of how the the movie the movie came came to be. There was a moment, though, where you almost didn't make this movie, correct? There are a lot of moments where we almost <laughs> didn't make the film. I mean, look, this this film uh, was just gigantically difficult to make. You know, they gave us they gave us um, a budget that I thought was uh, that I thought was uh, what they told us the budget was on day one is not what the budget was um, when we started filming. And, I, and it's nothing dishonest. It's just that, you know, reality hits. And, you know, we get a cast, and the cast um, is a very good cast, but uh, it may not be enough to raise 
you know, enough money to make the movie with uh, for the wishes of the original budget. And so that gets cut down a bit. And then, you know, they find that maybe war films are not as sellable as, um, you know, as they had originally thought. And so the budget starts getting slashed. And so I have to start, you know, you know, redoing uh, the screenplay to make, uh, you know, to make those adjustments. But um, then uh, we couldn't get weapons at some point. We didn't have enough, enough weapons. We didn't have enough ammo, you know, all, all sorts of things made it very difficult. And then, and then Scott Eastwood breaks his ankle right before we start shooting, a few weeks before we start shooting. He's playing Clint Romache, the recipient of the Medal of Honor, and that guy is running around <laughs> on during that battle. I can tell you that. It's not suitable for somebody with a broken ankle. And the insurance company almost shut us down, and I had to negotiate with the insurance company to keep us open. It was, you know, it was very hairy, you know. It was, it was very, very difficult to, from... We call them RPGs. We were hit with an RPG almost <laughs> every day in this movie, you know. So when you decided to make this film, um, mm -hmm. it was on the heels of uh, the unfortunate passing of your son. Uh, right. As, mm -hmm. um, he went into cardiac arrest and passed away. Um, mm -hmm. But that story, you know, you had claimed that it was sort of an epiphany um, when he had passed on. Well... Yeah, it's. Do you, do you have uh, you have kids? I do. Yes. Okay, so you can't imagine, uh, and and uh, you know, you can't even begin to imagine. You can only imagine. No, I, I should say you don't because, even want to imagine if you're a parent. Yeah, it's it's just an unbelievable event in your life. We were we were in preparation on the film before we started shooting. And my mother called me. She'd been notified by a police officer in Michigan. Um, you know, Hunter lived in, my son Hunter lived in California. He was at a music festival in Michigan that he was in the hospital. No details. Only I could get the details. And I called, um, this hospital in Muskegon, in Michigan. And they told me that indeed my boy was there and, um, they had gone into cardiac arrest and, um, and the nurse, you know, I'm in Bulgaria. I'm in fucking Bulgaria. And the nurse tells me in no uncertain terms that um, he's not going to make it. And I got on the phone with my wife and I got on the phone with my ex-wife and with my daughter and my son's girlfriend. And I said, okay, you guys get to Muskegon, Michigan. And he's on all these machines. And you just talk to him. You keep talking. Always somebody talking to him. Keep him alive until I get there. Because I don't know what will happen to me if I arrive to a corpse. And they did that. And I got there. And he was alive and not conscious, but he was alive and make the decision to, um, to pull the plug. And when the plug was, was pulled, um, I was told he's got 20 minutes or so. During that 20 minutes of just sort of staring at him and kissing his forehead and telling him, and we're taking turns telling him how much we love him. Um, uh, you, you can see his chest moving up and down. And when that ceased, we would know that he had died. And my daughter says to me, you know, Dad, I know that, and this is while he is dying. Uh, she says, you know, Dad, I know that you feel like you cannot go and make this movie right now, but, you know, you really do have to go and make this movie right now. Because of, if Hunter knew that everything fell apart because of him, it would just destroy him. And in, and in fact, the last time that I saw my son um, was at an event in my house where I invited the cast to the outpost. And he was hanging with all those guys. And he was so proud of this movie that we're about to make and this thing that is so deeply personal to me. But the most important thing was that at the second that he lost his life, I realized that um, he was the same age as these guys. He's 27. He's more or less the same age as the guys who died at, at out combat, these eight guys at combat outpost Keating. And the, the level of love and support I got from the families was just remarkable. And we became one. And I love the, I love the, those families. I, I literally love them. And they love me. 
and um, they became unbelievably cooperative. And the gift that I gave them is the gift that I gave my son um, with the dedication at the end of the movie, which is that, um, you know, they say that people die twice, once when they leave this earth and the second time when the last person speaks their name. And what we've done for these men and for my son is that their names will forever be spoken. It's, uh, it's powerful. Um, yeah. You know, and again, uh, I mean, I get shook thinking about it. And, and you know, my words don't obviously measure up to it. I mean, the condolences no. that I send your way. Uh, no, if, well, thank you. Well, look, Hunter died of a blood clot. It just came out of out of nowhere. I mean, you know, we did an analysis and he was, and it turns out that he had these genetic mutations, but we didn't know that. Right. And so, you know, there's a song that's at the end of the film called mm-hmm. Everybody yep. uh, Cries. And I, I wrote that song and I wrote it on the plane flying back to Bulgaria. And it's a song that it, it, I'd always wanted the soldiers to have their own song sung on the base to be sung by them. And then we'd have a professional singer sing it at the end. I didn't know what it was about until Hunter died. And I realized we're, we just need to examine the lives that we are living because we can go at, at any time, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot, and there's nothing more brave than those voices from the grave, you know. Only, you know, only they will never lie, only, you know, only they will know why. And it's... Um, it's, you know, it, it became, yeah, it's the most profound moment of, of, of my life and, and everything, uh, that changed my life because everything about now is honoring my son and I can only honor my son by doing the best work that I can and, and only doing work that I think is important to me in some way. It, you know, I, I don't mean that I have to make moves about uh, political causes or civil right, no, right, rights sure. or, you know, but I mean, things that are like, would make Hunter proud. And so that's, you know, my life's dedication in, in, in general, you know, you know Joe, you, Joe Biden, you know, if I may just say sure, one, ahead, one more thing about this is my wife, Kira, after, um, I'm sorry, I get very um, emotional no, sometimes, it's it's this. Please, but sorry. my, when my wife gave me, um, Joe Biden's book called Promise Me Dad. He wrote it about the death of his son, Bo. And if you've listened to Biden the past two years, you you realize that he, like me, was driven by a sense of purpose that he understood only after Bo died. And he writes that in the book. And this is also um, how, how I, you know, now feel. That, you know, we have to be driven driven by purpose. And, um, and this is my life's purpose now. And so I, I called up Millennium, you know, right after Hunter died, that a few minutes after. And I, and I spoke to the dude and I said, listen, um, I know you're making lists to replace me right now and that's fine. But if you want me to come back, I will. But I'm going to make, I'm telling you guys, I'm making the movie my way and everyone needs to get out of the way. I'm going to, I'm going to, and I got on that stage in front of the cast and crew and I said, guys, understand what you're getting yourself into. I said, I'm going to put my, my blood and my bones into this movie and, um, and you can either, um, do that with me or you can be buried underneath my blood and bone because I'm not, and the crew got so behind me. It was really amazing. It was really amazing. It is amazing. I, I was going to say that you sort of, you know, again, you're, you're, for lack of a better way of phrasing, you, you're now a gold star dad with all these people, right? With, with all the people you're choosing to honor by making this film, as you had yeah. alluded to, that you have your own little gold star, um, you know, unity with them. Uh, and not only that, the guys who help you make this film, the actual soldiers who survived this yeah. thing, you know... Uh, yeah. Making it for them and and their brothers was as important, I assume. But I, I just think that that you know, yeah. I, I can I can sense that synergy between you and the the families of those who were lost and and the men who were there that day, and it all sort of comes together in, in a very symbiotic way. Yes, 
Well, I would say that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gold star adjacent because right. sure. you know, the, what the way, you know, those, you know, the fam, what the families lost was, was pretty amazing and very, um, it's, it, it's just, it's just absolutely awful. And, you know, one of the things that I, that I, that I realized and that I promised the families and I promised them this really from the start because I, I knew it intuitively, but now I really understood it, that if I, if I was going to see my son's life, death, I should say, portrayed on screen, I would want it to be no frills. I just want the truth to be told. And that means that when I shot, when I filmed the deaths of these men, it would be with the same fanfare or lack of fanfare that they died instantaneously without music or sometimes they lingered and you need to show that you need to show that as, as well. And, um, so, um, that, that became, you know, very, very, um, very important to, to me as well. Just, uh, again, you know, I, I, I want to I know, send it's, a, it's a bit hug. of a buzzkill to talk no, about this, it's, but, it, but, it's but you know, look, because... I, I, I will, I, I'll tell you this, um, so Daniel Rodriguez, right, was on our set, and, mm. you know, and he has to recreate the death of Kevin Thompson. And I'll tell you, he did it cold and clinically. Not an ounce of emotion from the guy as he's doing it. And then he filmed it, and when it was done is when he fell apart. He behaved like a soldier. You know, he did his, he did his job. He did his job, he did it really well, and then became human about it when it was all over. And it, that was pretty amazing. What? And then you had guys like like Stony Portis, mm-hmm. the commander of the unit, or um, Chris Cordova, who was the medical officer. They come on the set, and they, you know, they they have a mini breakdown. And Ty Carter, who was the recipient of the Medal of Honor, he comes on the set, and the PTS just hits him like immediately. He stepped on. He stepped on a hose, and made a bang, and he he went down, breathing hard. You know, and was, uh, his eyes darting left, dar- darting right. I'm glad he didn't have a weapon with him. It was hairy, you know. So you know, th- this this movie, man. I mean, I'm telling you, it was harrowing to make. You know, one of the things I asked Daniel when I spoke with him, um, <clears throat> because I, I sort of long for this experience, and I know others who have had the fortunate pleasure or fortunate, you know, uh, ability to have, to go back to the ground where they were involved mm-hmm. in combat. Um, there, right. There's some catharsis in that. And and Rodriguez told me, I, I, you know, I asked him, would you want to go back to Camdash? And he, he said, well, no, I, you know, I would, but like, I got to do it on set. Like they had done such a great job. And he had told me how much mm-hmm. walking back there sent such a rush of emotions to him. Um, and yeah. that there was catharsis in it. And, and mm-hmm. I, I, I would love, I would love to set up a, a foundation or an organization where we could bring soldiers back to those sites. If I ever had right. a chance to go back to the place in, in Iraq where the, the, the biggest combat I was involved into, I would go back there in a second because you would, yeah. I, I, well, I just, I want, it's not that I want to relive that. It, it's, there's a sense of closure, I think, that it's, that yeah. I survived it and I can go back mm-hmm. there and face it. But I think more than anything, it's that I feel like for me, and I can't, I won't speak for anybody else, a lot yeah. of those PTSD things that I deal with, for some reason, I feel like you, you meet them head on and you can squelch them there and leave them there, right? Like I don't right. have to carry it with me everywhere I go. And, right. and I think you created that for a lot of these guys in this movie. Uh, and whether they recognize yeah. it in that moment or not, you know, those mm-hmm. moments help them deal with all of this. Yeah. I think uh, I do recognize that. And I think that that uh, categorically happened on on the set. It absolutely did. It was, um, yeah, it, it was it was really something to, uh, to watch. Yeah. And, um, you know... Um, it's interesting because, you know, Scott Eastwood, he'd done a couple of military films, but Caleb Landry Jones, who plays Ty Carter was not military at all. And, uh, when I, when I first met Caleb, right. 
who I'm dreaming wins the Academy Award or gets nominated for the Academy Award for this movie. He's so brilliant and he's so fucking brilliant. He's just unbelievable. Um, as as uh, as Ty Carter, he um, I I met him at Mel's Diner restaurant, and he shows up, and he's got he's like thin like olive oil from the Popeye series. Mm-hmm. He's got hair down to his ass. He's stoned, <laughs> just stoned off his ass, and yammering a mile a minute. And he's, you know, just not military, like at fucking all. And then I sent him to meet Ty, and Ty, Ty calls me. He says, "This guy's going to the gym, right?" But I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, t- I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. Is that he gave his brother the script to read, and his brother is an ex-marine who lost both his legs in Iraq. And the brother tells him, Caleb. You're going to make this movie, and, uh, and you're not going to fuck it up. You hear me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the brother, with his prosthetic legs and all, shows up in Bulgaria and starts training Caleb and is just not going to let him be anything other than a, you know, a soldier. And it's interesting because Ty was a very difficult guy, a very difficult soldier. He was not popular. People didn't like him. Was an asshole there, according to Ty Carter himself. And so, on the one hand, you've got a guy who's unsoldierly in um, in his um, demeanor and attitude, but uh, the soldier in him came out during that battle in an extreme way, enough that he receives the Medal of Honor. And the um, and the the brother uh, just makes sure that he's going to do that. So, you know, although Caleb was not a soldier, his brother. Uh, Certainly was one, and his brother got him uh, got him squared away. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's really awesome. I gotta ask you, what is the difference between a war film and an action film? Well, a, a war film should be grounded in some, in, in, certainly in some form of, of reality, and that um, and that the the horror of the experience is much more important than the thrill of the experience. So, you know, Rambo is not realistic. No. And kids dream about being Rambo. You know, the movie Top Gun was much more of an action film than it was a war film. True. You know, and let me put it to you this way. In an action film, you dream of being the hero. In a war film, the last thing you want to be is the hero. Yeah. You know, you know there's nobody, you know, when Top Gun came out, they had... Um, in the lobby in some of the places, recruiting stations. And I can tell you this, nobody goes, to, nobody watches the outpost and comes out and says, I want to join the military. <laughs> yeah. No, not one, not one, not one person. Well, I, I will pay you uh, a compliment that I don't pay often when it comes to military movies, because guys like me watch them with a very critical eye, uh, mm-hmm. a, as they should. I, and I think you understand this, but I will tell you, uh, I know that the combat scenes are very accurate when I start to shake and I can feel my heart beating a little faster right. while watching them. And and to right. your credit, that happened when I watched this because it's just sort of, you know, that 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 recreation that brings you back there where your body just starts to have this reaction to, mm-hmm. okay, I need to be, like, I'm sitting on the couch and I feel like I need to be up and moving, right? Because there are so many things going on around me. I think Black Hawk Down did that nearly nearly yeah, flawlessly. Did. I think that there were other war films that were just complete garbage. Uh, right. and, and this is no disrespect to the people who made it, but I think Lone Survivor was bastardized Hollywood crap. It wasn't a, it wasn't a war movie. It, there were, the war scenes were not very... Accurate, if you ask me, at least from my well, position you, of combat. You know, it's interesting. I, I cannot speak to that. I, I thought Lone Survivor was, um, you know, I, I, technically a very good film and uh, did, did really well. And a lot of people, you know, really, really like it. But I, what I can tell you is that when you say credit to me, it's really credit to people like Jericho Demon and Ray Mendoza, who are our military advisors, and, um, and credit to Ty Carter, who was so specific about what happened to him, and credit to Stony Portis and to Chris Cordova, who really took us 
um, you know, very specifically, uh, you know, with with what what happened on on that day. And you know, our military advisors they became like they were really fucking anal about it, and I and I right. accepted that. You know, I I really you know, I'll I'll, I'll tell you quickly that. We, as I told you, we shot a lot of these scenes as uh, as oneers, uh, meaning that there was no cutting away, meaning they had to be perfect. And if you had to do more than one take, that was a big deal. You have to do more than two; it's an even bigger deal because mm-hmm. you've got everything has to be working perfectly, right? The actor has to be perfect. The cameraman has to the operator has to follow the actors perfectly, exactly the way I want it. The explosions have to happen at exactly the right time. They have to be responding to explosions properly. The stuntman, everything has got to be perfect, right? And so we did that, this one long take of um, Carter and Larson uh, carrying a guy in a stretcher yep. among all these massive explosions, and they go into the, into, the, into the military tent, and it's a big fucking deal, this scene. And we fucking, I'm telling you, dude, we fucking nailed this on, on take number one. And I just remember the, the absolute jubilation, the jubilation in the room. Ty Carter was hugging people. Oh, it's so brilliant. You got it so right. And then, and, uh, you know, and all the people who had done all the pyrotechnics, they were high fiving. We really nailed it. And we're all so happy. And then in comes Jericho, the military advisor. He goes, no, 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 no. So and so was carrying his weapon completely fucking wrong. You got to do it again. <laughs> and I said, "Dude, we can get away with this. This is just a it's just a movie, man. We can." And he goes, "Okay, well, if you want every veteran in America to laugh at you, fine." And then I said, "Okay, reset. Let's do it again." And we this happened over and over again. But you know, the one of, one of the things that that I'm that I'm finding is that veterans love this film and the amount of Respect we've gotten from military time, stars and stripes, um, from, um, uh, you know, uh, We the Mighty, from, from everybody, right, about how authentic the film is. The, the Twitter love we've gotten from veterans has been enormous. Yeah. And it's because of my military advisors. Well, again, and, credit you know, to those, them. Yeah. You, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I, I did my job. You know what I did right? I listened to them. That's what I did right. But they, it's it's it is they who got this thing looking completely authentic, and that is the by far the most important reviews that I got were from uh, from veterans. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you this. This film um, it didn't go because of the pandemic. It didn't go into theaters like it was supposed to. Right. It went into a, a VOD and then Netflix. But it did enormously well there. It's the number one film of the summer by, by a lot, I would think. Millions of people have seen it. And I think that what happened is what happened to, you know, a, a, you know, a much greater film, but uh, I, I can make this comparison to Platoon, the Oliver Stone's movie, where veterans sit with their families and their friends and they say, you want to know what it was like? This is what it was like. Yeah. And there is a tremendous value in that. Tremendous value in that. That that's the kind of thing that completely warms my heart. Yeah. And that was, you know, that's the most important thing in the end. No, I, again, I I, I I can't say enough about those moments in the movie that had me mm-hmm. so drawn yeah. in that I felt like I was reliving my own well, combat you. scene. So no, thank you very point, much. Bravo to everybody. Um, was there anything? that died on the cutting room floor that you wished was in it or, you know, I understand, look, you can't make this thing five hours long, right? You're trying to encapsulate 12 hours Mm -hmm. into basically what you did was an hour's worth of a movie and it's nearly impossible to do. Yeah. So, well, yes, there, 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 first of all, the stuff that we never filmed, but there are, there are scenes that I wish were in the film and there's one scene in particular, one sequence in particular that uh, somebody at the studio took out of the film over my objection, and um, and I, I and, but it is in a, a special director's cut that was actually put into theaters um, around Veterans Day. But you know, I, I think it pretty much died in the vine because of the pandemic. You see, people just not going to theaters no matter what. And but it, there was a scene that I put back into the film. 
Um, and there are a few scenes that I put back into the film for that special cut that you'll be able to see on Memorial Day. There's going to be a, a new DVD release of the director's cut of the film. And you'll see some of the stuff that um, that I had taken out for length reasons or um, uh, losing a fight with the studio. When you look back at this work and the work that you all put together, um, describe mm-hmm. it in a couple of words. I mean, is there some adjectives that sort of stand out to you um, or a theme that sort of as you were making this thing, you just kind of all rallied around, so to speak? The men. Is what it boils down to, you know, telling the truth, mm-hmm. you know, it's, the, you know, you know, you know what I, I, I really find with war films, it's sort of what you've been alluding to, but we can say it straight out that <clears throat> veterans and soldiers, when they see themselves portrayed on screen, what they want, it's not necessarily to be made into heroes, right? You know what they want? Just to tell the story the way it is. The truth. Yep. Tell the truth. Tell the truth of what it's like over there. And and that's kind of why I might have been harsh on my critic of, of Lone Survivor, but it wasn't historic. It wasn't accurate. And I well, that's that. a different. That's a different. Yeah. Okay. That's a different story. I mean, you know, I know that there was some fictionalization in that. And and to be honest with you, you know that you know that that is sometimes necessary yes, in filmmaking. Right. And but I will tell you that the um, our battle um, um, was not fictionalized in any way. We took things out. There was there was an outpost on top of the mountains called Fritchie, which uh, Op um, Fritchie, yep, yeah, it was the uh, yeah, which we which we took out. We didn't have the big river, which played a part in the battle, and um, and we took out. This was the only movie where we took out heroism from our lead character because we didn't have time to show it. But, you know, Carter did a lot more stuff than just what you see in the film. But the first half of the film, there's nothing in it that didn't happen, but most of it did not happen to that unit. Right, yes. Right? You know, I the was book, wondering the that. I was wondering. But, I, I, again, I, I, you have to allow for some sort of, um, sort of meshing of the truth and timelines and things of that nature to create context, right? You literally have to do it to make the movie right. makeable, in the, makeable in the first place. And it's um, so like, uh, you know, we introduce these other commanders who suffered different fates and not all of them were with three, six, with Bravo Troop 361. Right. You know, but, you know, I, I needed to, you know, have my actor, my lead actors in the, in the whole way through the movie. And so, you know, we conflated that. But I, but I, I will I will tell you this. We got um, the permission of everybody involved, like um, the, the you know Orlando Bloom plays uh, Ben Keating. Um, he was Lieutenant Keating. He's Captain Keating in our film mm-hmm. um, because that is um, what he is promoted to posthumously. And um, I called his father and I said, "Look, I, I want to put your son in a different unit. I want to do this." And he said to me, "You have my blessing." And the reason, the main reason I got his blessing is I think that uh, Ben's favorite movie was Lord of the Rings and Orlando Bloom was going to play him. So he said, whatever you want. <laughs> but it was, uh, but I got his permission. I got the uh, permission of, there's a guy named um, uh, Robbie Eskis, Captain Ron, uh, Robbie Eskis, who also died, but he was not with 361. But I put him with 361 um, and I got permission of his family and, you know, basically, before I did anything that was in any way not true, I got permission of the real people and all their families. That's uh, that's amazing. If yeah. if Hunter had seen the movie, what do you think his response would have been? I think he would have loved it. He was a major cineast, and um, although I don't know what the movie would have been had he had he had he not died, I you know I honestly don't know what it would have been. It's a different movie than what it would have been. I, I don't know what it would have been. You know, I don't know. What have some of the Gold Star families and some of the guys in the unit, some of the things they said to you after the fact that stayed with you? Millennium, the studio that made the film, did something very generous, which is we flew in all the Gold Star families to see the film way before its release date. The film wasn't quite finished. We showed it at the Naval, um, Navy Memorial in Washington, D.C., 
and um, Jake Taffer was there, and Jake was completely unnerved. You know, you watch Jake Taffer on TV interviewing these uh, heads of state and these generals, and and you know he he's completely unfazed by them, and um, but he but but here he was faced, he was stressed, he was really stressed out. Because what if the families turned on the film? What if they were upset by the film? My son would never curse like that. My son didn't die like that. My son uh, was too yeah. Christian to do this and mm-hmm. do that. And that's what we were nervous about. And, and so was I. But exactly the opposite happened. I mean, you know, we, we I, I'll say it one more time. People will forever be speaking their names. Forever. Forever. Because of us. And that is a gift that we have given them. And they gave us the gift of their cooperation and their love. And um, they'll be my friends forever, I think. Well, on that note, Rod, uh, again, I I can't endorse the movie enough. Um, Thank you. I I thought it was excellent work. And I'm not just saying that. I I think people who listen to this show know I'm not shy on opinions. (laughs) Nor anybody who listens to my radio show knows I'm not shy on opinions. So I wouldn't wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. (laughs) No, you wouldn't say, but, you know, if, if you did say, you probably wouldn't have invited me on. And I, so I, I do really appreciate it. And, um, you know, you, people can see it on Netflix now. It's also on, on VOD. And, um, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's the most important thing I've ever done. And it's all downhill from here. Yeah. Well, again, if there's any reason to go watch it, it's to keep the memories of those eight men alive and your son alive. Um, Thank because you. he is certainly part of this film. Uh, and as you said, it would be different if the events hadn't transpired in your own personal life. But uh, again, yeah. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing this story it's, with us and, and just certainly uh, being honest. And listen, and opening up your personal story, I know it couldn't have been easy. It's not the easiest, but I but I do want to tell it. It's very, it is, That is important to me. So thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Well, Rod Laurie, thank you so much for being part of the Hazard Ground. Absolutely. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.